Helping the Hills Upland Path Network meeting. I think I know most of you, uh, but for those uh, who may not know me, uh, my name is Helen Lawless and I work with Mountaineering Ireland. Um, we're hosting uh, the meeting this afternoon. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background to Helping the Hills in a moment. Just want to say too that, you know, we're really pleased with the response to this. The numbers this afternoon are far higher than we originally anticipated. I think it indicates the interest in the subject of upland path management and people's desire to tap into the experiences of others. And even though our online format today is not what we would consider ideal for a, an upland path networking event, it has meant that we, we do have more people here. So it, it has its advantages as well. Um, in case I forget to do so later, I want to start by thanking uh, the Croke Patrick Stakeholders Group, in particular, um, Martin Keating, Matt McConway, who both of, you'll be hearing from both of them this afternoon, but also uh, Caroline Goucher, um, who works with Mayo County Council and is helped, that's Caroline waving there, if you've got her on screen, um, who's helping out and providing some technical background um, this afternoon. So in, in terms, I, I said I'd give a little bit of background on Helping the Hills. I'm going to be brief because we're all going to need to be very brief this afternoon because of the, the numbers. Um, but um, the Helping the Hills initiative was started by Mountaineering Ireland in 2012 because as the organization representing Hillwalkers, we were recognizing uh, the increased evidence of path erosion along popular routes on Ireland's uh, more popular mountains. And as well as um, degrading the natural environment uh, that we love and care about, that was also having an impact on the quality of people's experiences. And uh, those of us who've walked uh, abroad and particularly in Britain, uh, were very cognizant of uh, the measures that have been taken to address erosion, um, particularly in Britain. And we, we started helping the hills to tap into some of that experience. And I suppose to, um, nurtured the groups that were already starting to deal with this issue on the island of Ireland as well. And our aim really is that we arrive at uh, erosion control solutions that are effective and ones that fit into the, the landscape as well. And we, we organised a conference in Glendalough in 2012. And I see Carolyn on screen. Carolyn was one of our speakers. Many of the other people here today were at that event. Um, we subsequently had um, a site visit or a study visit to the Lake District and the Yorkshire Dales. And Tricia Dean was one of the people here who participated in that. And we then had a seminar event at the end of 2013 where the learnings from the study visit were shared. And all of that, you'll find information on those events on helpingthehills.ie. Out of the uh, seminar in 2013, um, we developed a set of principles to guide the management of path erosion on the island of Ireland, and they still sit there on the website. Um, since the end of 2013, we've been trying to work more directly with groups around the country that are working to address this issue in various parts of the country. And many of those groups have embraced the Helping the Hills guiding principles, and they've been incorporated in um, tender documents and I suppose the work ethos in, in many places. I think all of the organizations that we've had contact with though recognize um, the, the benefit in sharing learning and we've seen some of that in more recent years through the Ascent project uh, that Donegal County Council and the, the Moran Heritage Trust and Sleeve Gullion were involved in. Um, we've seen too how you know individuals can find themselves somewhat isolated and rather than reinventing the, the wheel. Um, we're keen to develop a network um, so that people can share their experience. Um, this afternoon is about networking, so I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves, to say if you have a role in Upland Path work, what it is. I really want to appeal to you to be as quick as possible. Um, there are some organizations here with multiple representatives. And in those cases, we're going to ask one person to speak on behalf of the group, just to say what projects um, you're involved in, what the current status is, and you know if there's any major learnings that you, you want to share briefly with us. 
Um, and we're going to ask if you can remain on mute until I, I call your name and then hopefully we'll get people in quickly. And uh, Dennis Golden, um, actually, no, Caroline has her hand raised, so just bear with us. You can unmute yourself, Dennis. Caroline, yes. Can you just cover the part about the recording of this, please? OK, yes. Um, you may have noticed in the uh, email that we sent out that we, we said we'd like to record today's session. Um, for the benefit of some people who cannot be present and to help us afterwards in processing uh, the outputs from today. Um, I did ask if anybody had any difficulty with that. Nobody came back to me to say that they were unhappy to be recorded. So we are uh, recording and hope to record the, the full proceedings this afternoon. Does that cover that, Caroline? Yeah. OK. Um, Caroline, as you're up there, do you want to very briefly uh, introduce yourself as well? Hi everybody, delighted to be here with you all today. My name is Caroline Goucher and I'm an administrative um, assistant to the Co-Patrick Stakeholder Group. And I'm the technical assistant for today. So bear with us all as we navigate this very big, large Zoom. We have 50 people on now, Helen. <laughs> Great, thanks Caroline. Uh, Dennis? Dennis Golden, Northwest Mountaineering Club. I've been involved on the Edigal project, the current one and on the previous one 20 years ago which also included the Sleeve League path. So that's it. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, John O'Callaghan. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm um, part of the um, Crowpatrick Stakeholders Group. I'm also uh, with Mountaineering Ireland with Helen, and um, I'm also a member with Frank of uh, the Ireland's Upland Forum. So that's, uh, they're my three stakes in this meeting today. Fantastic. Thanks, John. Jed? Hi, I'm Jed Dowling. Um, we've got myself and my partner, Georgia Macmillan, have a small group tour company, if you like, in Newport and Mayo. And I'm also involved in numerous uh, environmental and outdoor education projects. Um, and I'm also just across from Coke Patrick, so I'm hoping to help out on the path scheme there uh, with Matt and the team. Fantastic, thanks Jed. Martin, I should say by the way, people are not, uh, Martin Keating is next, people are not in any order of priority. Um, I'm taking you as I see people on my screen, otherwise I'll miss somebody. So Martin Keating, please. Hi everybody, Martin Keating is the name from uh, Mayo County Council. I head up our environment, climate action and agriculture section there. I also chair the Croke Patrick uh, stakeholders group and along with uh, Caroline and Matt and I think maybe some of our trainees are in on, on the call um, as well this afternoon. Um, we're part of the team that are delivering on that and we'll be talking to you a little bit later in the meeting about what we've been doing. That's super. Thanks, Martin. And Matt, Matt McConway. Hi, uh, Matt McConway. So I'm the, the path manager at Crow Patrick Stakeholders Group. Uh, and I used to have my own company, Upland Access Limited, that built mountain footpaths in Scotland for 20 years. And now I'm over here. Fantastic, and you'll get to hear more from Matt shortly. Uh, next up is Martin Carey, please. Uh, yeah, um, hello everyone. Nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, I'm Martin Carey, I'm Chief Executive of Moore and Heritage Trust. So my role is to, to get the funds to do our path work in the mornings. and I'll, I'll leave it to colleagues to give you a bit more detail on them. Thanks, Martin. Um, I'm now going to, I've realized I can give people a bit of notice about unmuting. So Inga, you're next, uh, followed by Nikki Hoare. Hello, everybody. My name is Inga Buck. I'm the Rural Recreation <coughs> Officer in County Donegal. And together with uh, Dennis and Ursula and uh, Helen, I'm part of the Erigal Group. Thanks, Inga. Uh, Nikki? Um, I'm Nikki sorry. Jim Sheehan, you're coming after Nikki. So go ahead, uh, Nikki. I'm a volunteer with Mountaineering Ireland and have participated in various meetings, site visits, that um, this area mostly with the Orne Heritage Trust, National Trust, and MARF. And 
I'm ahead of Walker. That's it. Thanks very much, Nikki. Um, Jim Sheehan, followed by Craig Somerville, please. Jim, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I quick clicking the wrong button. Um, Jim Sheehan from Club Colin, um, I'm a member of Mountaineering Ireland. I'm Mountaineering Ireland's representative on the Wick Wicklow Upland Council. And uh, as far as I suppose today's thing is concerned, that we're involved in uh, drawing down funds for a major path survey in the Wicklow Uplands. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, Craig, uh, yeah. followed by Kira Monley, then. Right. So, how are you doing? I'm Craig Somerville, um, National Trust, uh, and uh, in Belfast. So, I've uh, I was given responsibility for Devis and Black Mountain a couple of years ago. So, um, uh, thanks for the invite onto this group, and, and hopefully, I can learn a bit because I'm a bit of a newbie when it comes to the uplands. You know, most of my stuff's always been lowland stuff. But, but at the minute, really, what I'm involved in is uh, the the Devis Summit, and and uh, you know, there's some paths put in in Devis a few years, about ten years ago. And we found some major issues with the summit path and mostly to do with drainage and and, uh, and just some strange design features, which was mostly to do with discouraging mountain bikes, uh, it seems, you know, but I've got a bit of money. So, um, uh, yeah, and I'm speaking to a guy, Ryan Hamilton there, and he said to say hello whenever I mentioned this uh, forum. And I think a few of you might know him from, uh, from Hamilton's Environmental over in Scotland there. So... Um, yeah, so hopefully getting through, getting through it, but with huge amounts of problems, as you can imagine at the moment, <laughs> with with, uh, with just about everything seems to be undermining uh, any any anything. So uh, that that's me. Great. Right. Uh, Thanks very much, Craig and uh, Kira. Followed then by Frank Nugent, please. Hi everyone, my name is Kira Munley. I'm the outdoor recreation manager in the outdoors unit within Sport Ireland. Um, as you know, Sport Ireland do a number of things in the outdoors, including um, managing the National Trails Register and developing criteria for trails within Ireland. I'm relatively new to the role, so I'm really looking forward to hear some of the stuff that's been done in the network. And I'd like to thank Helen and Mountaineering Ireland for inviting me here today. Thanks, Kira. Uh, Frank and then Catherine Quinlan, please. Yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, Frank Newton. I'm the chair of the Irish Uplands Forum. And uh, I was a, I'm an early member of Corla Natua, and uh, we were we've been advocating obviously for um, war, for mountain access as well as um, as a result of that the mountain project. So I, I became a member of the the mountain project subgroup, which uh, is undertaking pilots both both in uh, um, stop and start pilots. I have to say in the Reeks and um, in Benislava. And uh, yeah, this year in, in our own plan, our own strategic plan for this year, uh, we're planning a capacity building conference in the West of Ireland around October, COVID-19 permitting. And um, we would hope to include path repair and bog restoration among the sort of capacity building skills we want to develop within our upland uh, communities and partnerships, etc. Great. Thanks, Frank. And Catherine and then Clodagh Duffy after Catherine. Catherine, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine Quinlan. Um, I am a member of Mountain Mehel Southeast. Mountain Mehel is um, a voluntary organisation. All our members are voluntary. We do a lot of track work, repair work, maintenance work, mostly in and around the Galtees in County Tipperary. Um, I'm the secretary there since 2017. And I'm also representative on Mount Mehel Ireland. Mount Mehel Ireland is the governing body which oversees um, all of our branches, of which we have four now, I'm happy to say. Um, and they do a lot of oversee work and structure. Um, I'm also the secretary of Mount Mehel Ireland. I'm a hill walker. One of our projects that we've been on in the Galtees down by King's Yard, which Helen is familiar with because she joined us on occasion down there. We're still working on a track there. We're redeveloping it, digging out and locating culverts and um, tracks. And uh, we're very happy down there. We were hoping that it would be finished. Um, but due to lockdown, we had only one day out last year. And um, we've had a lot of issues as well with storm damage. So we're continuing to work on the track, but hope to get it done this year. That's great. Thank, thanks, Catherine. Uh, Clodagh and then Trisha Dean, please. Hi, I'm Clodagh Duffy. I'm the Recreation Manager with the Dublin Mountains Partnership. So that's a partnership of 
local authorities in Dublin, National Parks, Creature and Dublin Mountain Initiative, which is grouping up recreational users of which Mountaineering Ireland are affiliated. So part of my role is looking after the recreation infrastructure across the state lands in the Dublin mountains. That includes monitoring, maintenance and um, new projects. And we do this work with quilty staff, with contractors and also um, working with Dublin Wicklow Mountain as well. Thanks, Clodagh. Uh, Tricia and then Brian Dunn, please. Oh, I am the former recreation officer here in County Kerry. Um, so for the last couple of years, I would have been involved with the McGillicuddy Weeks Mountain Nexus Forum. And I would have been greatly supported by the Irish Uplands Forum, Frank and Brian there in Wicklow, and obviously the man himself, Matt McConway, who taught us everything you know. <laughs> it's all on you, Matt. <laughs> um, so we did a, a lot of training. So we actually managed to get some of our participants and myself actually trained up. And we actually have a little qualification now as well to go along with the training that we had undertaken in Uplands Path Restoration Works. Thanks very much, uh, Tricia. And uh, Brian? <laughs> Yeah, uh, so I'm Brian Dunn from the coordinator with Wicklow Uplands Council and I suppose traditionally would, would have been involved with uh, securing permissive access across private lands and more recently then uh, trail development and trail management and currently then as Jim mentioned there earlier we have a leader application in at the moment for an upland path survey um, of uh, over 100 kilometres of upland paths in the Wicklow Mountains where there's erosion evident so we're currently in that process and hoping to have um, have a successful, I suppose, application. Uh, we should have word at the end of this month, and um, hopefully, then we can start in in the spring. And I suppose what we want to do is to establish a, a baseline of the condition of paths across the Wicklow Mountains. The last one that was done was in 2002, 2003, and uh, hopefully, then that we'd use that information to seek future funding then for where the repairs are most needed and prioritise the, the paths that need it most. That's super. Thanks, Brian. Um, Thomas, um, I forgot to warn you, but you're you're next on my screen, followed by Ursula. Oh, you're on mute, Thomas, I think. Sorry. Go for it. Uh, yeah. yeah, Thomas Nilburn, and I work for the Northern Ireland Environment Agency um, in Conservation Destinations and Protections Unit. And my team's role is to deal with any plans or projects that might have an impact on designated sites in Northern Ireland. Um, so this includes the consents uh, for board for uh, path repairs. And we've got a lot of various projects in the moment, uh, including Kulka and ones with National Trust. So. Thanks, Thomas. And um, Ursula McPherson, you're next, then followed by Chris York. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm up here in Donegal, and uh, I'm a member of the Article Stakeholders Group. And, uh, and now the we have an implementation subgroup um, as we move along with that project. Um, I'm also a member of the Access and Conservation Committee with Mountaineering Ireland. And I suppose over the years, I've been very involved with Mountaineering Ireland. Thanks, Ursula. Um, Chris York is going next. And I just want to say that uh, Chris has kindly offered to help us out with facilitation uh, this afternoon as well. Uh, so some of you will be in a, a breakout room with Chris later. Uh, so Chris and then Mark for National Trust after that, please. Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm based over in Scotland. I'm in on the East Coast um, at the moment in a su sunny kind of place. Um, I've been over in Ireland um, since about 2015, working on feasibility studies through to uh, design specification work. So started with the Eregal project, worked on the Galtees, worked on Cropatrick, Sleeve Gullion, Quilker, uh, Wicklow Way, and I'm hoping uh, that that um, application that Brian's put in is going to be successful uh, for the uh, Upland survey uh, in the Wicklows. So a, a wee bit of um, mostly uh, survey type work, and I've got a magic finger that I point at things for site supervision. Super. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Mark, and then Phil Savage after Mark, please. So we're headed to the morns. Uh, Mark, you're on mute. Go ahead there now. Yeah. Good to hear. Well, it's Mark. Uh, Hello, everyone. Uh, National Trust Ranger, part of the Morn uh, team, that basically in the last two years we are delivering the uh, uh, Sleep Donor Path Improvement Project. Uh, it's a project that is done on partnership with Mon Heritage Trust. And it's a project as well that had the privilege of 
having Mad McConway uh, upskilling the staff and upskilling the, the volunteers just before the, the lockdown. And basically what we have achieved in the last uh, two years is uh, nearly the completement of Glen River Valley up to the saddle of Donner is where we are working at the moment, just nearly at, at the top of the, of the steps. And also as a, as a update, as last update, uh, as you might see on media, is uh, we have uh, successful complete the, the sourcing of the of the stones for the next stages of the project, uh, including that is, is going to include the repair of the saddle and the donor slope all the way up till the till the summit. And finally, I like the great achievement. One of the great achievements of the project have been the great uh, volunteer participation. Uh, up to uh, more than 100 people have been uh, collaborating and working together with us. Uh, and basically, uh, you, instead of that, uh, of that difficult time with the pandemic, we have achieved more than 2,000 2, hours recorded of volunteer work. And one of the, the major things for the future of the project uh, is just to keep on going with that volunteer collaboration. Uh, and that's all. <clears throat> that's lovely. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, Phil and then Caroline, please. So. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Philip Savage. I'm Senior Countryside Officer from the Moran Heritage Trust which is a fairly new role with an emphasis on upland paths. I'm currently involved with works on Slave Donard and Slave Gullied. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Carolyn Ferris from Outdoor Recreation in Northern Ireland, but working across the whole of Ireland. Um, so currently we're working in Wicklow National Park, Glenvey National Park and Donegal and the Sleeve Blooms. And as part of all of those projects, um, we're involved in doing a pretty much a broad brush assessment of the carrying capacity uh, and future sustainability of some of the key paths in those areas. So really I'm here today just really to get refreshed on the thinking um, with upland footpaths erosion. It's been a long time since I was involved in it um, and to learn from all of you online. Fantastic, uh, thanks Caroline. Um, Johnny Brunnock next and um, following Johnny, uh, we'll have Bob Aiken. Yeah, I'm a, a Johnny Brunnock from with Waterford City and County Council the Rural Economic Development section, um, working primarily on uh, our uh, recreational trails, um, walking and cycling and Waterford Greenway. And uh, yeah, really here today to see uh, what I can learn, particularly in the context of, um, of the Comer Mountains, I suppose, in particular here, here in Waterford and various issues and potential projects that could be coming up. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks, Johnny, and hopefully you'll get some useful learning and make connections with people, albeit uh, under strange circumstances. Uh, Bob and then Anne Brindley after Bob, please. So go ahead, Bob. I feel like I should be introducing Bob myself, really, because he's been such an inspiration and encouragement to Mountaineering Ireland um, for eight or nine years now. Um, and he'll probably be too modest to tell you that he's a retired upland path manager with decades of experience and has visited many sites on the, the island of Ireland. Go ahead, don't Bob. Think I, don't think I need to add anything else to that. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> You're allowed at least <laughs> chuck in an opinion or something. <laughs> Well, just say, hi folks, great, great to be involved still in all of this. Uh, as, as Helen has said, I had a very long professional career in upland footpath management in my retirement, found I couldn't stop and have been providing um, or trying, trying to be helpful with advice and support to particularly through Mountaineering Ireland uh, for the last seven or eight years. Thank you, Bob. And Anne, and then we'll have Claire Riley uh, from National Trust. 
uh, Anne Brindley, uh, Mountain Mahill West, uh, based in Galway. And in the past four years since it was set up, uh, there's been repair work on Maul Main Path, uh, the path up to Maul Main, about 800 metres, which were drained, cross drained, and uh, restored with natural stone. Um, styles on Ben Lettery, um, the uh, Bla Mount, um, Blackhead Loop in County Clare. Um, so the work is uh, for Mountain Meha West is between Galway and Clare. Lovely. Thank you, Anne. Uh, Claire and then Leon Fox from Department of Rural and Community Development. Uh, Claire, go ahead. Hi, I'm Claire O'Reilly and I'm one of the other uh, mountain ranges for the Mourns working alongside Mark, who's already provided our update. Thanks, Claire. Thank you. Hi, Leon. I'm Leon Fox. Um, so I work in the Rural Programmes and Policy Unit in the Department of Rural and Community Development. And we have responsibility for outdoor recreation. Um, we have programmes such as the Outdoor Recreation Infra Infrastructure Scheme, the Walk Scheme, and also Coral Nathuha. And I suppose I'm here today to hear about the current work being undertaken in the different areas and see if there's any other ways we can maybe support some of this um, through maybe the Outdoor Recreation Infrastructure Scheme. Fantastic. Thanks, Leon. I appreciate your, your participation. Um, David Pollard, uh, you're next, and then Simon Gray. And sorry for not pre-warning you, David. Thanks, Alan. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, David Pollard is my name I'm with uh, Mountaineering Ireland, and I, I'm the chair of the Access and Conservation Committee. Thanks, David. Simon, and then Louis O'Byrne. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Simon Gray. I currently work for uh, Ulster Wildlife on the CAN project um, on Kulka Mountain. Uh, previously worked for the, the Marble Arts Caves Global Geo Park, um, looking after the boardwalk and managing uh, access on Kilka for a number of years. And through the current project, um, I have been overseeing light touch works and conservation works um, on the summit plateau in the Montane Heath habitat. So I'm um, really glad to take part in this and hoping that we can continue to bring some some positive feedback towards Kilka in, in the coming years. Thanks, Simon. Um, Louis and then Frank McMahon. Hi, I'm Louis O'Byrne, lifelong walker in the hills. Keen interest in the walking trail development in my native Wicklow, which I've seen deteriorate rapidly in recent times. I am also a member of the Wicklow Uplands Council. That's it. Thank you very much, Louis. Uh, Frank and then Helen Donoghue. Hi, I'm Frank McMahon. I'm uh, one of the founding members of Mountain Mehill Southeast, which we formed nine years ago. I'm a member of Mountain Mehill Ireland, uh, also a member of Mountain Air in Ireland, have been on many of these upland forums. Um, two years ago, I worked with Matt for a day above in Crow Patrick, working in the top section, and now I'm working full time with Matt on the project at the moment. As one of the four trainees on Crow trainees. Patrick. Fantastic. Thank you, Frank. Um, Helen and then Julio. Mm -hmm. I'm the idiot who's called Apple because she hasn't managed to um, identify herself. Okay, so Helen Donovan, and then who's a member of MI Access and Conservation. And uh, I should say, Helen, at very short notice, has agreed to uh, facilitate the third breakout room this afternoon. We had planned for two, but with increased numbers, we decided we, we should go for three. So again, some of you uh, will be in with Helen later. Uh, Tulio, uh, followed by uh, Darren, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Tulio de Jesus. I'm a past GMIT outdoor education student. And at the moment, I'm part of the Co-Patrick Path Trainee members. So happy to be here with you, sharing all our adventures. Well, we're looking forward to seeing some of the fruits of your labours, Tulio. Uh, fantastic. Darren and then Dahi, please. There, uh, so I am the AONB and Geopark Manager for Newry Morning Down District Council. So my team managed the Upland Trails in the Ring of Gullion and trails around Strangford and Keel AONBs. And we were a partner on the Ascent project. Uh, we're currently working on um, a bit of erosion around the uh, State Care Monument on the summit of Sleep Gullion. So it's about 120 metres of path uh, and, and, and lots of erosion around it. Hey, thanks, Darren. Uh, Dahi and then Matthew Bushby, please. Hi, I'm Dahi de Forge. I'm the head of recreation with Quilcha. And I suppose as the largest landowner in, in the country, Quilcha has many kilometres of upland paths 
come directly under our own um, management control and and uh, provision. But I think what's been most successful in terms of upland paths over recent years has been our partnerships with many of yourselves. Um, and I would call out Mountain Metal, especially in, in the east and all of the work that was started there in terms of upland path work many years ago and has indeed flourished into the development of, of many others doing the same. I would see ourselves primarily facilitating that, that, that partnership work with others in upland paths uh, management and, and development. Um, but I think another very important uh, thing that Quilt should do is provide a lot of that access in the lowlands to the uplands and really um, I suppose that's what we'd like to look at, at further through provision of car parking and, and the lowland trails that, that bring you into to, to the upland path. Thank you, uh, Dahi. Um, Matthew and then James, please. Hi, everybody. It's good to see your familiar faces and, and such great attendance today. And thanks, Helen and Mountaineer and I for organising this. Um, and as, as a lot of people have said, it's all about the sharing experience and, you know, in these changing times. And I suppose the key thing is that, you know, we just see massive, uh, say, threefold increase in different places up on the mountains and the impact that that might bring places that hadn't really much used before getting really popular now. And I think all of that is, you know, consistent with the observations that we, we saw through the Ascent project that we were working, you know, as a partner on that um, as well. So current work we've been doing, um, you know, uh, Mark had said about the partnership that we have with National Trust on Sleeve Donard, um, and Phil's been needing a bit of a team below that on the section of the Glen River. Um, We've been working out with Gullion, as Darren had mentioned, and doing some work out there with them, and then hopefully over the next few years continuing that. Um, and we've been focusing ourselves on some key sites that have, have had quite a lot of impact on Sleeve Binion, uh, coming up from the current little area and down onto the sort of uh, Sleeve Lamagan site there. And just to give you a bit of a picture, in, in December, I think it was, there was National Trust helicopter in stone up to their work or at the saddle and up to the summit of Sleeve, Binion, uh, Sleeve Donard. And then on the same day, you know, Dave, who's here today, and you'll see him in a minute, um, was up with a, a contractor with a digger doing work with Andrew, uh, the North Tor section. And then we had Ryan Hamilton, who's been mentioned already, working just below for us on some handwork on a crag. And then we had some volunteers, again, as Mark had said, so important to the effort generally working below that or, or, or on, on some work too. So, you know, and in a way it's almost like, is that gonna be the way forward to some extent that there's just gonna be a, a big focus on uh, more is needed, but I suppose this is the point of this. It's, it's how is that planned and planned in this sharing way and, and well thought out. And I think this whole focus on training and development is so key. And again, something that was raised in the Ascent project, but also maybe techniques and approaches that we're looking at now were maybe conceived in a way where you know, things have changed now with climate change really moving and also these user numbers and maybe not changing and going back down to what were two or three years ago. So I think there's a context there to consider. But um, thanks very much. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, James and then Leo Don. Hi there, I'm uh, James Fisher. I work with Morn Heritage Trust alongside uh, Phil Savage there I spoke earlier, just on, on the projects that Matthew was outlining, both on uh, Sleeve Donard, partnering with the National Trust, and on Sleeve Gullion. Thanks, James. Uh, Leodon, and then Wesley, please. Hi, um, uh, my name is Leodon Slattery. I am currently working as the Walks Officer, the Tourism Officer for the Dingle Way on the Dingle Peninsula here in Kerry. Um, so I am involved in doing some upland restoration work currently in Mastham Pawn on, on the saddle of um, and Brandon. So we started that last summer and we are hoping to have it finished in uh, by next July, hopefully. Okay, thanks, Ludon. Uh, Wesley and then Mark Gallagher, please. Yeah, Wesley Atkinson, I'm the Regional Manager of National Parks and Wildlife in the East, so I'm responsible for the National Park in Wicklow. Um, so I'm here today just to catch up on what's going on over in the West. If, uh, but also just uh, everyone has spoke about all the issues we have. You know, we've got um, the build up of numbers um, has really become apparent. And so anything we do needs to be really well future proofed. And I was really just to catch up on and say what's what's happening and just share experiences. Um, we're already, as Brian has mentioned there, we're, we've, a, we've a hopefully 
uh, PAP survey coming up, which will take in a lot of the, the routes in the National Park. We're working with uh, Consark and Caroline on the, the, the master plan, and we're just about to tr start tra trail, um, trail inspection um, protocol across our site, but also with Quilcha and the Double Mountains Partnership as well. So uh, that's really all I have to say at the moment. It's a lot of interesting work, Wesley. Thank you. Um, Mark and uh, then Dave Farnan. Hi, everyone. Mark Gallagher, Donegal County Council, uh, currently employed in the community enterprise section of the council. We're looking at the Aerial project. We're currently uh, procuring the design for the, sorry, the consultants for the final review of the design and the ecologists for it, uh, working with the local stakeholders and the uh, and together with the landowners to develop the path up uh, Erigo Mountain. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Sorry, Dave, do you want to unmute there? Just say hello. Or you can wave at us. <laughs> we can't hear you, Dave. Sorry. Give us a wave, Dave. <laughs> Oh, you can hear you're unmuted, we can hear you now, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, Dave Farnham, uh, Area Ranger for Moore Heritage Trust. Um, and we're planning to start work with a contractor, um, another session on Binion, um, hopefully mid to late February. So. Thanks, Dave. Um, Imelda McCarran, and apologies for not for warning, and uh, then Liam Donnelly. Uh, yeah, so I'm Eldon McCarran, I'm acting geopark manager for the Marble Arch Fields UNESCO Global Geopark. Um, and we manage Colca Mountain and Cavan and Fermanagh um, and all of the management issues that come with the infamous uh, Colca Boardwalk um, and in Fermanagh. So, yeah. Considerable management issues, yes. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Melda. Liam? Good afternoon. Uh, I'm currently working with the Northern Irish Forest Service in the consultation and engagement section. Um, I'm transferring next week to the Natural and Environmental Division of uh, DERA, of NIEA. So I'm really here just to get up to speed with trail developments and uh, how these projects are progressing. Excellent. Thanks very much, Liam. And we're delighted to have you on board this afternoon. Um, Ellen Luby and uh, then... David from Croke Patrick, after that, please. I'm just a recent member to um, Mountain Metal West, so I'm working with Anne Brindley. And um, just here today just to learn more about the efforts of for Mountain and stuff. So. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Ellen. You're very welcome. Um, David and then Robert Grandin, please. Hi there. I'm David. I'm part of the Croke Patrick Stakeholders Group as a trainee under Matt. Thanks. Thanks, David. And again, we're, we're looking forward to, to seeing your work too. Uh, Robert and then Patrick Lynch, please. Hello, um, my name is Robert Brandon. I'm chair of Mountain Metal Dublin Wicklow. We're 18 years on the go now. And there was one project that Claude would wish us to finish, but we haven't been able to. In four more days and we'll do that. And we have a major repairs then happening on the St. Kevin's Way and a really big one then on the uh, Rhinus Pass. In Glendalough, all going well. The next year or two, we'll be back. I certainly hope you get to fulfil that uh, agenda, Robert. And uh, Carl Boyle, I think you, uh, if if you're there, Carl. Um, Hi, yeah, great. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Um, I'm a director with uh, Crow Patrick Stakeholders Group for the last few years, and. Uh, it's been brilliant to be part of it, to be honest, just the all the various stakeholders uh, coming together to, to make real progress uh, under the, the stewardship of Martin Keating as well. So it's been it's been really good. Um, I suppose I was with Mountaineering Ireland for a number of years uh, uh, during which Helping the Hills commenced. And it's it's genuinely uplifting to see the number of people from right across all the elements and, and interests of, of the mountain environment in, in Ireland. Uh, being on online today. So delighted to be part of it. Thanks. Thanks very much, Carl. Is there anybody else um, on the meeting this afternoon who has not uh, had an opportunity to introduce themselves? I think, great. I think we've managed to. Oh, Patrick, Patrick sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. You mentioned me and then skipped over. Um, yeah, Apologies. My name is Patrick. 
no yeah. problems. My name is Patrick Lynch. I'm countryside manager for the National Trust, and I work um, in South Down on, in the Morns Upper Slopes of the Morns with Mark and Claire. And Mark's kind of given an introduction to what we do, so that's it. Thanks, Helen. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. And look, thank you, everybody. Um, I do want to say, if we, I have everybody's email address. Um, as you've had this brief glimpse of each other, I would like uh, to share email addresses. If for any reason you would prefer not to have your email address shared with the group, just drop me an email and I'll uh, withhold your email address when uh, we're next uh, sending out an email. Uh, otherwise, we'll, um, we'll share the, the list with people. And look, without further ado, um, I'd like to uh, proceed uh, with the, the presentations and our our first presentation this afternoon is from uh, Martin Keating. Uh, Martin is the, the chair of the Croke Patrick Stakeholders Group and has patiently nurtured and guided the, the Croke Patrick project for a number of years. Um, Martin, have you been enabled to share your screen? Or... Yes, uh, I think Caroline is going to, to do that for me, in, for me now. Um... So thanks very much for the introduction, Helen. And um, yeah, delighted this afternoon and really pleased to see the numbers of, uh, of, of people online this afternoon and the uh, interest that there is in upland um, rec restoration uh, and, and improvement. Um, so um, I suppose maybe a brief introduction to who the, the Krog Patrick stakeholders kind of group actually is. Um, I suppose we were set up as the um, community response to the erosion on Krog Patrick. And uh, Krog Patrick is probably uh, a, a little bit um, uh, unique in that uh, it has a, a very wide stakeholder group, given that it is Ireland's um, ho holy mountain. So the stakeholder group in, in, includes uh, the county council. It includes um, uh, the, the church because of the pilgrimage path and actually having the church on top of the, of the mountain. Uh, there's a, an archeology span group that was set up a number of years ago, all of the tourism interests, uh, local development. Uh, and then at a local level, the shareholders on the mountain, the local community, uh, the adventure sector and uh, Mountaineering Ireland, who have been a, a, a very uh, significant support to us over the last uh, kind of number of years. Um, I'm going to kind of get, go through, I suppose, uh, the, the setting up of the stakeholder group and uh, and, and walk you through the journey and the more detail of, of the work that we're doing currently will be presented by, by Matt in the next presentation. So I mentioned about it, it, it was set up because of the concerns uh, with the growing number of visitors that, that, that the impact they were having on the mountain, deteriorating physical condition. Uh, the widening of the traditional path, um, you know, uh, to varying degrees, but to over 70 meters wide on the on the summit cone of the mountain. Um, and I suppose arising from that, the, um, the absence of any structures to manage the events and, or, and, and individuals on the mountain, the uh, liability of shareholders and landowners on the mountain, uh, the deteriorating quality of water supply for local residents, uh, the safety of visitors climbing Crow Patrick, um, uh, an increasing number of uh, rescue kind of ev events on an annual basis. And uh, okay. I suppose the status of Crow Patrick as Ireland's holy mountain in its, I suppose, uh, in, in its shape, which it, uh, it certainly didn't look like a, uh, a place that was uh, respected and uh, held in the in in that sort of a, of esteem. 
So um, I suppose we set out uh, initially with some quick wins that we needed to get. Um, maybe first of all, I'm just showing you some of the images there of the of the scarring on the summit of Cro of Cropatrick um, and uh, of some of the other issues, the issues of adventure races, the issues about health and safety and people's uh, uh, lack of understanding uh, of the um, of the mountain and what climbing it actually actually um, actually meant. So some initial uh, quick wins, I suppose, for the stakeholder group were uh, a proper information uh, kind of flyer setting out the safety messages, the message of the local uh, of the pilgrimage and of the local um, uh, shareholders kind of on the mountain, what was important to them. A map was created, the first kind of map uh, of, of it in one uh, in one sheet. Uh, I think Ordnance and Survey have moved kind of since then to produce an excellent uh, kind of map uh, of the mountain now. Appropriate signage was put up kind of uh, on the mountain indicating all of the, the appropriate messages. And I suppose for the first time in terms of managing it, uh, uh, pedestrian counters were installed kind of on the mountain giving us um, information about what was what was actually actually, actually happening uh, on it. I suppose then we had to take on a, a journey to find this, the solution and I suppose one that took uh, a lot longer than uh, we initially anticipated, but one with a number of steps in it that each of which was really, really important. Starting in 2017 with the condition survey and identifying the, the approach, uh, Chris York walking the talk uh, engaged with us on, on that piece of, of work and produced the initial report and, and recommendations uh, kind of following for that, which was 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 really really good a really really good start, I suppose. However, and the um, summit cone proposed particular um, uh, concerns and challenges, uh, kind of uh, for us. And in order to, I suppose, overcome those, uh, there was a collaborative workshop uh, uh, held to uh, kind of fine tune the solution for the cone, and we had. Uh, practitioners in design, construction and maintenance of upland paths from the from UK, Scotland and Ireland, uh, who participated in a workshop over over a number of, of, of days. And at that, I suppose the, we agreed the, um, the the methodology for the construction of the pathway on the summit. Uh, following on that, we, we, we decided it was really that important that trial path work was necessary on the on the summit cone in order to, I, I suppose, prove uh, that that the methodology that was come up with could actually work. That progressed in 2018 and 40 metres of trial path work was done on the summit and 20 metres at a lower level. And uh, Matt McConway uh, took that took that on uh, that path work on, and uh, I suppose that there our working relationship with uh, with Matt kind of kind of commenced on uh, on Crow Patrick. Following on the the trial path work, we did an an evaluation of it in November two thousand and eighteen. Chris. Uh, York again led out on that for us. Again, it was a workshop type event with all of our stakeholders developed over a couple of days and recommendations made to the stakeholders, which were uh, finally uh, a kind of uh, a, a accepted. We moved from there into, into 2019 with the, um, with the planning, um, I, I suppose, uh, element of the of the uh, of the project uh, in compiling uh, the application there was a, uh, as well as the uh, con, uh, the the work program that was proposed there were certain other other reports that had to be pulled together uh, ecology archaeology screening and 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 a screening uh, 
for uh, an AA screening uh, in, in relation to the Clue Bay uh, SAC complex. So there was quite a big body of work. Uh, it took all of 2019 to, uh, to um, pull all of that together. While that was kind of going on, uh, we, we, we had to, I suppose, make two, two real big steps. First of all, getting a proper governance structure that would be fit for purpose uh, uh, and, and allow us to move into the planning and to the implementation phase. And for that, because of the of the insurance kind of issues, and the, uh, to provide some level of uh, of um, indemnity to the local um, to the shareholders, a um, a, a um, company uh, limited by guarantee was 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 established to bring the project uh, forward. Uh, that company has has directors from the shareholders the local development company, the Westport Parish and Mayo County Council. And I suppose the most important step have been that was then to get a lease, a lease from the from the shareholders um, of the PAT to the uh, to the uh, company that was uh, what was formed. And there was a huge amount of, 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 of work in, in this. Now, and now that the, a solution had been established, I suppose people were anxious to see it implemented, but it, it involved a, a lot of consultation and getting over 46 kind of shareholders to sign over their interest or a, an interest in the path to the, uh, to the stakeholder uh, holder group. Uh, this took a lot, of, a, a lot of research, a lot of cajoling and encouraging kind of people. Um, Caroline, our, our, our administrative um, lead, our support on the project, took a lot, of the, a lot of this on, and it was through persistence and uh, and not giving up on people that uh, we we got this uh, eventually um, uh, across the line. That allowed us, I suppose, to move into the into the planning kind of kind of phase of it, and and I suppose we considered this the really important part of it because it allowed us to um, put forward our our, our plans for uh, for Crow Patrick and put forward all of the assessments that were carried out uh, kind of on them, being open with people about. What was what what was um, what was proposed for the mountain, and then uh, I, I suppose engaging to build that level of support at a both local, uh, regional, and national kind of level for the solution that was was proposed, and again we did a lot of public engagement kind of on 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 that far in excess of what was required under the um under the under the planning process but again we felt uh, it could only be positive in terms of uh, building uh, the the support that was required uh, kind of and building people's understanding and their expectations of what what we were going to do and what the end result uh, might might be um the planning process completed about the end of 2019. I think it was October. It was it was it was passed, and uh, I suppose uh, I had always told people, uh, you know, that we had to find the solution first, and we had to get consents for the solution first, and then uh, that the money would come. And I suppose. Uh, that's when I, I suppose uh, the penny dropped that we really had to go and uh, actually deliver the solution uh, now. Um, I, I suppose we had established through the process some kind of principles about the about the solution that helping the hills principles were were were, were totally um, enshrined in what we were uh, in what we were going to do that we wanted to build some of the highest standard of design with good environmental practices around it uh, the to avoid the addition of intrusive features we wanted to deliver it 
in a sensitive way and to machines to be used to the to the minimum given the terrain we wanted to take the opportunity to train and upskill local people because we understood the need uh, to maintain the path after it was after it was built that it isn't just a build and and move on um, kind of process and we wanted to do something that was sympathetic to its setting but respectful of the cultural value of the of the mountain also so um i suppose we, we said about putting a proposal together uh, for the department of rural and community development um uh, setting out our training and development approach that we want to appoint uh, to employ a path manager and deliver the project as a, as, as a training project. We had the opportunity to for year round working on the project because we had a uh, uh, path work to do from from the very lowest level right up to the to the highest level we recognized i suppose the need for ongoing maintenance and that uh, anything we did had to be uh, uh, i suppose designed and built to a high standard and that it would require uh, i suppose a local input into maintenance in the future and we also recognize i suppose visitor management as being uh, kind of critical uh, to to this to sustaining the mountain into the into the future there are some uh, additional steps that we have to uh, have to take in the in the months uh, ahead <clears throat> regarding um managing um events on on the mountain but i think we're in a very strong uh, place now to deliver uh, kind of on on those um, we, we made a successful application to to the, uh, the Department of Rural and Community Development. We got notified of a, of a grant offer in a, in December or in in I think it was the end of January uh, last year. And um, last year, I suppose the first number of months were taking up uh, with uh, getting us all uh, adjusting uh, to uh, to COVID restrictions, but uh, with a dedicated kind of team uh, in the stakeholder group uh, and with his help from mountaineering uh, in kind of Ireland as well, we persevered and uh, did our, our, our recruitment um, and got it completed uh, in, 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 in October last year. And um, we um, thankfully went on 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 site in in uh, in December 2020. Uh, we've uh, I think uh, four weeks work completed. Unfortunately, COVID restrictions have um, have, have meant that the that the work on the project uh, ceased last. Um, last uh, Friday, but we're hoping to be back on site a, a, again uh, very, very, very shortly. I'm going to end at that um, and maybe let you hear uh, Matt's presentation and then we can have some, some, some time for some questions maybe after that, Helen. That's fantastic. Uh, thanks very much, Martin. And uh, I guess this is... Uh, that's a nice lead in to uh, Matt and the, the bit that I know many people are really keen to see uh, the, the work on the ground. Okay. Go for it, Matt. Yeah. Um, I think you have to share the... Oh, sorry. I thought um, Caroline had you set up. Uh, apologies. I better find you and then enable you to do so. Oh, Lord, so many faces. There you are. Um, Caroline, if you can get there any faster than me, please do. No, she's saying no. I need to find you on the participant list, I think, Matt. So just bear with me for a okay, second. Matt, I think I've made you a co-host now. Okay. So hover along the bottom till you see screen share at the bottom of your screen. Okay, it's looking good, it's looking good. Go for it. Something's happening, yeah. Find okay. your presentation. That's it. This is looking good. You have the floor. Nice one. Great. <clears throat> okay. So 
Uh, thanks, Helen. Thanks, uh, Martin, for that. So, um, yeah, just to reiterate, so I was appointed to uh, this position, uh, path manager at uh, Crow Patrick uh, in November of last year. And my main duty, I suppose, is to help implement the Sustainable Access and Habitat Restoration Plan, which is basically the path management plan for Crow Patrick. So to do this, I work alongside our newly formed path team uh, and I offer advice and training where needed. And I also schedule, allocate and implement the work on the ground. So as uh, Martin was saying, although I started this job last year, uh, my connection to Crow Patrick goes back over two years ago, 2018. Uh, when I successfully tendered for two weeks uh, path construction work at the Summit Stretch or the Cone, as it's called locally. So this was a trial or experimental piece of work. And the reason it was a trial was we had to develop a technique unique to Crow Patrick uh, to make use and to make sense of the smaller stone uh, found on these exposed scree slopes. So to use this type of stone, which is not typically used in a big way in mountain uh, path construction, uh, well, that was the challenge that was set us. So this is what we came up with. Uh, this, to describe this, I will use Chris York's words as he describes it a lot better than I can. So it's on your screen, but it's uh, basically a mixture of small and large boulders will be used to create an irregular stepped walking surface. Some of these steps will be a single stone, others uh, composed of a number of smaller stones packed together much like a dry stone wall. These multi-stone steps will provide a level surface with enough for a foot to be placed comfortably. Each step is placed at different heights given walkers different options for foot placement, depending on their stride length. So during the course of the works, we had uh, great help in the form of many volunteers. Some were from the college, the Galway Mayo Institute of Technology. Uh, some were from the Southwest uh, Mayo Development Company and others were members of Mountaineer in Ireland. Uh, we also had uh, both of our own, Martin Keaton and Caroline Goucher up with us working really hard. Uh, as, a, as a wee aside, I think it, that really impressed me at the time as to the commitment of the people I was working with. So as Martin was saying, roughly 40 metres of a two metre wide path was constructed in the two weeks at the Cone. So for perspective, uh, I believe it's like uh, another 600 metres of this, shall we call it scree pitching, uh, still to complete at the cone. So I'm really glad to say that the trial worked and the information gained in its construction was, you know, a small part used in the planning permission process. And thanks to Martin, Caroline, Chris mm. and Helen mm. uh, and the Crow Patrick stakeholders, uh, we are here now uh, finally carrying out restoration work on Crow Patrick. So our team started work on the 1st of December after uh, a successful recruitment and selection process uh, to, to get this team together, despite uh, carrying out this process, you know, mostly through Zoom. So we were really lucky here as the caliber of candidates for the team was very high. Having said that, we've assembled a great team, I feel, uh, self-motivated individuals who all have expressed enthusiasm for working on Crow Patrick, but also they see the bigger picture uh, down the line uh, of increasing the skill levels and capacity of mountain path workers on the island of Ireland. 
So as you can see from here, um, our first work uh, as a newly formed team was building a 2.5 metre wide cross drain uh, with 20 metres of ditching. And this was, uh, if anyone who knows Crow Patrick, this was near the start of the path, uh, just above the statue. And we think it worked quite well. So a big part of the project is to train our team to do the path work on Crow Patrick. So our team of David, Frank, Tulio and Bernard have now worked for uh, between four to five weeks and have had an introduction to most of the major elements of upland pathwork. This includes large stone pitching, path revetment, drainage and landscaping. Our team has developed into a great team uh, as well, which is really important in the mountains. For example, in moving large stones, uh, as well as looking after each other uh, for safety reasons. So we also encourage our team to be ambassadors of the project. Um, but to be fair, they haven't really needed any encouragement. Uh, all are really enthusiastic about the project. I've also got to say that uh, the majority of people passing us to date have been very supportive and very complimentary of the project and the work that we're doing. So to be able to do our work safely, um, we have covered manual handling and material handling in our training on the difficult terrain that working on the, the hills bring. So we have had training in the use of a manual winch and uh, other methods, uh, basically of getting the stones to the site. So this is, this is good when uh, team understanding comes into its own. And I'm glad to say it looks like it's one of our strengths. Well done, lads. Proud of you. <laughs> so that stone is probably about, you know, not far off half a ton. So good effort. So Crow Patrick is one of the busiest hills in Ireland, and it's probably the most eroded as well. Uh, basically, damage has been done uh, along the full path line from the top to the bottom. But um, what has been bad in terms of erosion, uh, perversely, has been good in providing opportunities for all year employment for path builders, which in many hill paths is not the case. What I mean by that is generally work at 2000 feet or thereabouts would only be able to be carried out during the summer months, perhaps. However, on Crow Patrick, we have a lot of damage on the lower slopes, which means that we can basically work, uh, the work can be carried out throughout the winter months. So that brings us to the scheduling of the work. So we are sticking closely to Chris York uh, of Walking the Talks uh, work program and detailed specifications of the work. This has been very important about how we go about our plan. However, we have a degree of flexibility that is very handy regarding where we work and what we do. For example, during the summer, if the weather turns extremely nasty when we're working at the summit, we can leave the summit and find work lower down, <clears throat> excuse me, and a more sheltered aspect. So this cuts down on the time lost uh, to the elements. We also have a degree of flexibility in translating the, the specifications that Chris drew up um, as to what work has done, taking into consideration uh, real world factors or unseen obstacles. So we are currently wor working on section two 
which is the second section from the bottom of the hill. As you can see, there is no defined route here with at least three major desire lines and lots of smaller braids in between. Also, the most defined line of these leads very close to the stream, becomes very narrow and is in danger of collapse into the, into the stream at several places. The solution we agreed on was to block this braid and landscape this lower braid with our spoil that we, we got from our excavations and then install a stone pitching in order to gain height to reach the middle braid. The top braid of these three major braids would then be mostly turned into a drainage ditch. Now this ditch was also a useful resource as it provided us with surfacing for our aggregate platforms that we built on the flatter sections. So once we reached the middle braid with our uh, construction of our large stone pitching, uh, the route flattened out. And however, there was a lot of uh, damage to the side of this middle braid uh, with a lot of collapsed edges. You can see the, the collapsed edges on the left here in the eroded gully. And our solution was the revetment and surfacing. So what we mean by revetment is basically a retaining wall that could be several courses in height, uh, depending on how much stabilizing of the slope uh, below the path needs to be done. So we also installed additional uh, stone cross drains and side ditching. In this particular case, our spoil from our excavations where we dug out the, the hole that we could put our stone in for the, for the cross drain, that helped fill in the eroded and washed out gully. So the, the stones we need to build our stonework are found locally. Um, getting the stone and moving it to where we need it can take just as long as the stonework itself. In each cross drain, for example, there's between half a tonne to a tonne of stones uh, that has to be moved manually. And in a three metre stretch of pitching like this, for example, there could be between two and four tons of stone used. So the, the pitching here is different to what we will do at the cone, as you can see. The stones are larger here and generally one stone tread will comfortably uh, take a boot, as we say. So stone pitching is generally used on steep parts of the path where aggregate or gravel would be impractical or prone to migrating either by washing out or pressure of footfall. So in the space of five weeks, I think we have made a great start to the project, not only in what we've achieved in work on the ground, but also in our training and development as a good path working team. So finally, for the ones amongst us who like to see some facts and figures, well, here they are. So um, 68 metres of ditching has been dug by the team, um, 80 metres of defining the path line. This was done by removing obstacles that would maybe throw people from the path line, uh, then reprofiling the path and topping up the surfacing where needed. We installed 19 stepped anchor bars. The majority were over two meters wide. Uh, we installed 25 meters of stone pitching. Again, this was at least two meters wide for the majority of the works. And as I was saying earlier, the majority of the time was bringing the stones to site. A lot of the stones were really large. Um, we constructed six stone cross drains 
and they were ranging from between two meters to three, me three meters wide. Um, we installed 27 meters of large stone site revetment. Uh, and, at, and at least I would say a total of 50 square meters of landscaping and blocking to block desire lines where uh, people would walk without them. So that's the team there, all looking nice and happy. Um, waterproof still clean. <laughs> <laughs> so that's basically my summary of work uh, today at Crow Patrick. So thanks for listening. And I'm going to hand this back to Helen now. Thanks very much, Matt. That's absolutely fantastic. And as somebody familiar with Crogpatrick, it's just wonderful to see uh, what you've achieved in a, a few short weeks. And I really do hope you and the, the team can get back out there before long. Um, we do have a, we want to give people an opportunity to put some questions now. And if you could, um, I was just going to say, if you could put in, click on the parties or hover over the bottom of your screen, uh, click on participants and you'll see a raised hand button there. So if you raise your hand, uh, we'll then bring you in to ask a question. I see a couple of people have used the chat function um, to compliment you on the John O'Callaghan saying fantastic progress. Uh, Trisha Dean likewise saying serious work, work undertaken and she knows. Uh, similarly from Imelda. So if anybody has any question either for Martin or for Matt, um, please uh, raise your hand there um we for those on a laptop it may be along the bottom um or even just unmute yourself whichever you're comfortable with yeah isn't it interesting how in zoom meetings people seem to be quieter than they would be in real meetings <laughs> well if there are no questions we can proceed but I, i'm Trisha, and I have one quick question, if I could just jump in there yes. for seconds. Um, Sorry, Tricia, go ahead. Yep. No, you're right. It's just for Martin, actually, because, um, yeah, I don't doubt Matt. I'd say if the lockdown wasn't here, I'd say most of Crow Patrick would be done at this stage. <laughs> There's a serious amount of work in a very short space of time, and the weather was bad, too, when you did it, so well done. Well, thank I you. you. And Frank, you knew you would get going eventually. Fair play to you for keeping at it. <laughs> Um, we're just hoping for a brownie on a Friday, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, I was wondering, um, just regarding the insurance, how did you come around that? Because that is a big stumbling block for us here in the Reeks. So we have actually ceased path work now. We finished out on Strakeen and we haven't undertaken any further works because we are running into issues with regarding insurance. So I was just wondering, how did you get about that? Um, yes, Trish. Um, yeah, it was obviously one of the big um, kind of concerns that 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 we we had. I suppose our corporate structure, or the governance structure that we set up, has has helped in that um, Mayo County Council is part of the the governance structure uh, for the for the project, and um, it, I, I suppose the, the simple answer is. You know, uh, the county council have come on board, kind of with us and with uh, with their insurers, uh, kind of with us uh, on the project um, to to provide uh, insurance cover. Uh, we, like everybody else, are, I, I suppose, uh, looking uh, for for more progress on the national indemnity uh, project that the department are are, are working on, and I, I I know work is still kind of uh, going on that, albeit uh, at you know that it, it is quite a complex area and it is it is uh, taking time, but um, uh, you know that's where we see the solution for it in 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 the future. But I suppose to say our the, the way we're structured has assisted us in getting that cover. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, Martin. Um, anybody else got a, a question that they'd like to put uh, to either, either of the guys? Can you see Trisha's hand? Trish, can you speak now? Sorry, is there another Trish? No, 
Arsenal. The boy, I think I just need to put my head down. I think that's what he was just saying. Don't forget to put the head back down after. Now, Ursula. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, Caroline. Um, just a quick question, Martin, and uh, um, before the question actually to both yourself and, or sorry, the question is to Matt, but to both Martin and to Matt, fantastic amount of work. And uh, it's really great to see the progress in the whole project. Um, so well done on that. But just the question, simple one, uh, when you were putting your terrific team together, did you source your team locally or have you gone wider than that? And was that, you know, your approach, was it deliberate or did it just come about from the applications you got? Okay, um, I'll maybe let Martin answer that one. I mean, my contribute, uh, uh, contributing to that was on the, the final kind of selection process, you know, like, so I was part of the panel, but maybe I'll let uh, Martin answer, you know, as far as uh, how far the, you know, the recruitment process went. Yeah, um, yeah, we went wider than 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 local in terms of, um, and and we got a, a very significant kind of a response. Uh, I assume we're talking about the 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 the, the trainees now. Um, yeah. They so so there was you know uh, nearly thirty applications kind of came into us. Uh, we advertised just locally and did some on on social media. Uh, kind of uh, as well and we seem to have hit the the, the target because mo most you know we, we i think interviewed over 20 of, of the uh, of those that that kind of came came forward uh, kind of for us um i have to say and i know at the end of the day uh, we picked the 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 four people that uh, you know that they're they're all there on 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 merit, you know, and uh, we didn't end up having a a local bias for any particular reason, and we were just lucky, I suppose, that uh, some people are are quite local, and uh, uh, and some people for, are from a, a a bit further afield. I suppose we're not trying not to be too parochial about it. And while Crow Patrick is our main interest, we've always said that we do recognize, I suppose, the need nationally to build the skill set uh, and that. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll kind of deliver on that kind of a, a objective through what we've through what we've done. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mark. Maybe just at this stage, um, um, Helen, if, if, with your with your permission, maybe I just might want to say one or two things about that national kind of kind of remit. And absolutely, we'd be delighted, Martin. Go ahead. Yeah. So okay, uh, we, I think we all recognise that we have um, you know a a highly uh, kind of skilled. Uh, path manager in in Matt McConway on the on, on the project with just a huge amount of uh, of of experience, and what we're I, I suppose we would like to maybe open that up to some other groups in terms of uh, making some places available on the trainee team uh, over the next uh, two years, uh, you know, over a period of time. So if there are People out there that would like to uh, to work on the team uh, for a, a a period or whatever period a week or two weeks or that we certainly we will look at that and try and facilitate that uh, over over the two years so that um, you know we can share the 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 training experience as as broadly kind of um, as 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 we can. And the other thing I'd like to say, and Matt can come in on, 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 on this himself, that while he is in the country, okay, uh, his primary project is Croke Patrick. But if there are difficult issues elsewhere that people feel his advice would be helpful on, you know, I think Matt's quite approachable and we're going to be uh, uh, flexible with any um, any uh, uh, any requests that come in in like that over the over the over the next two years as well. 
That's absolutely fantastic, Martin. And um, I think there are many others on the call who would um, welcome that. And I, I have no doubt um, Matt's going to get the, the odd message. Uh, Simon Gray is in there first. If you can come down and work for a couple of weeks on the trail, then, oh, he wants to come and help on Crook, Patrick. I thought he was going to rob your team. But <laughs> <laughs> um, look, that's um, that's really it it illustrates the difference i suppose in taking the approach of having a training project as opposed to a contractor led project how you can actually add value to the um upland path management community on the island of ireland uh, by by taking that different approach and um it, we look forward to seeing the the fruit that that will bear in the the period ahead um if anybody else wants to ask a question please be quick Johnny. Sorry, who was that, Caroline? Jim? Jim Sheehan first, please, and then Johnny, you're next. Yeah. Fantastic. Jim, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the problems with, um, with upland paths management generally is that it's relatively easy to get capital funding to do it. But a lot of the thing, you just see great projects out there, and I see it on, on parts of Wicklow and so on, where you've got new paths put in and new water bars and, and all that. But there's no maintenance. So is there any provision then for, for you know, continued maintenance funds uh, for particularly for this one, keeping the water bars clear and keeping the storms off the path and so on? Uh, is there a long-term plan there for maintenance with that? Martin, you're probably best positioned to answer yeah. on that one, are you? Yeah. Uh, look, um we, we, we recognize uh, the need for long-term maintenance and that that is going to be required. And we, at the Croke Patrick Stakeholders Group, we've set ourselves up to do that uh, rather than just to do a, a fix on the mountain and, uh, and, and move away. Um, but we have to, I, I suppose, take things uh, step by step um we will be <clears throat> while we have uh funding for the path work for a two year period you know we will be uh launching our own um fundraising kind of initiative um in 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 probably spring when we have a sufficient amount of work done to be able to demonstrate what it's going to be like and uh, uh and you know, uh, we hope that we will be able to generate uh, fr through through that uh, an annual kind of income stream that will help to support uh, the, the 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 work on it. Um, and we are hopeful, you know, that you know once the value of this work uh, is is seen. That it will be appreciated, and that there may be some help at at national uh, kind of level as 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 well uh, for that. So um, the the need is recognised, uh, but we haven't quite worked out uh, yet how, how it is going to be how it is going to be funded in the long term. Great, uh, thanks, Martin. Uh, Johnny, you have a question. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, it was it was a, a sort of a, a similar one along the funding lines as well. Um, just actually in terms of the initial path assessments and uh, I suppose funding for you know putting planning applications and design and uh, stuff like that together. Um, you, you, would that have come from one source or one application in particular, or would it come from various different places or kind of? Like we all do from time to time, have to have to get a bit from from here, there, and everywhere when it comes to to uh, sort of planning and the initial assessments. Yeah, uh, Johnny, much the same as that with ourselves. Uh, most of those resources came locally. <clears throat> the county council put in about twenty five thousand euro into it as seed capital uh, a number uh, of years ago, which uh, got us a long way towards uh, um, the. Um, the, the the initial uh, uh, assessments and uh, we um, we got bits here and there in between for the trial path work and the uh, other pieces of uh, of work that were were, were done so um, 
you know, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a bit, a small bit from every, from everywhere we, we that that we can, you know. And I know if you're working on uh, greenways and those sort of projects, you'll be you'll be well used to you well used to that. We've we we all kind of uh, kind of, but hopefully, I think there's some positives kind of maybe on that coming from the department in more recent times in in terms of how they're looking at uh, the funding of greenways and projects kind of like that i think the expectation maybe that local authorities would fund everything kind of might be uh that that you know uh might be softening a bit at at national level Leader funding might be in a position as well, guys, to, I know leaders coming to an end now, but in the past, yeah. leader funding would have been used to conduct some feasibility studies. Um, so what, who knows what's going to happen, Johnny, in the next round of leader, we don't know what, what kind of budget we're going to be looking at, um, but leader could fund. And with regards to the maintenance, what I didn't say at the start is um, we have an agri-environmental project here now that came directly out of the work of the McGill Reeks Mountain Access Forum. So it's taking the agriculture into account as well as the environment in the McGill Cody Reeks. So we're using some of that funding to actually fund some of our path maintenance works now, um, because it is definitely much harder to get funding for maintenance, ongoing maintenance, than it is to look to get funding for capital works. Um, so there, there are ways of being creative to try and get additional funding. Yep. Thanks, Tricia. And I see Vincent McAlendon posted a message in the chat there, just highlighting the, the fact that those with responsibility for projects like this um, or a role in policy making do need to emphasize um, that requirement for maintenance budget. Um, it's it's absolutely essential. You can't spend all the money buying an expensive car and then drive it without ever uh, servicing it. Um, Caroline has posted a message there about the breakout rooms. Um, so we're going to go into the breakout rooms now. Um, she has- one more question, Sorry, just one more question there. Um, Leah, do you want to come in? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, no, my, my question is just, um, I, uh, and, and we've got a lot of advice from, from Matt in the beginning as well. And um, obviously I, I work closely with, with Trish has been a great help to me since I started the job. But I was just wondering, over the next two years, what's the qualifications though that the team will have at the end? Sorry, is that for me, is it? Yeah. Yeah, is it the same as say, like with the team that we have, we are, are using or used was, you were involved obviously and Trish and Matt in training them. And I'm just wondering, will they have the same qualification or is it some other kind of different? Um, <clears throat> well, in hindsight, maybe Martin would be better uh, placed to answer that one. I mean, at the moment we don't have a, like a, a qualification scheme in mind. Okay. You know, I think in my mind, it's almost like a, like an old style apprenticeship, but maybe compressed into, um, you know, a quicker time scale due to the experience of the guys, uh, the way we started, rather than, uh, you know, like going for a qualification as such, you know, mm -hmm. but I don't know, like a, maybe, you know, Martin can jump in there. No, the reason yeah, look I'm asking is just that, it just seems to me like that um, for lots of people starting this work or for different, um, is that the lack of qualification in this country, the lack of experience on the ground of doing this Highland maintenance work. And obviously that's why we brought in the likes of you, Matt, from Scotland. And, and that's where the expertise seems to be. So I'm just wondering that like, you know, we were lucky when we started this, this project in that, you know, he, he had the team and Trish had started this work over in the McGillicuddy Reeds and they'd done the training and, and they had gained the knowledge. So therefore I'm gaining from that because I, I, there was people here on the ground that could do the work. Whereas I'm just wondering that like, you know, in order to, to, to expand these projects in the future and in order, you know, then that, that expertise is, is definitely lacking in this country because we haven't done you know those projects before we don't have the 30 years experience that you have in Scotland you know I went over there to visit last year and, and see some of the projects that you've done so you're way ahead of us in that kind of you know in that yeah. knowledge so I'm just wondering in terms of the training you know would 
um, not, not not like you know what is the cert at the end, but like you know a, that would be another team in Mayo that would all, all, also have that knowledge, which would be fantastic for other projects going ahead in the country. But I just pop in there, maybe I, I suppose from a governance perspective, the board have been very clear on Crow Patrick that that what we wanted was a competency based outcomes. So we we are developing a competence within the team, both in terms of the team collectively, but individually as well. And that in time, these people will may go on to other areas uh, and, and lead teams themselves. So it's very much a competency based outcome we're looking for in terms of their training. Um, and, and look at qualifications may come or not, but uh, uh, there, that may be a focus down the road. But realistically speaking, it's the competence is the key thing. Um, and, and if you want, the methodology is, is the one that, that Matt is deploying on the ground in terms of the training of the team. Uh, I think also I just add on, on governance, I think it's, it's hugely important that when it comes to things like the long-term vision for the project, right from the start, uh, we've been very clear on what it is we want out of it. Um, I'd say we've been patient, but with great urgency along the way. Um, we were never rushing to, to, to start the project, but we were determined to get to the start of the project. Uh, and, and I think that's really important um, because, you know, if we had focused on where was the funding going to come from, we'd probably have never gotten here. We solved all the other problems, believing that if we had solved all the problems uh, in terms of stakeholder management, in terms of um, the leases on the path, all the rest of it. Well, we'd have we'd have never we'd have never got going uh, otherwise. So solve your problems, the money will come for good projects. Has been our message. And likewise, when it comes to maintenance, from a, a board perspective, we're fully determined that this isn't a two-year project. This is a project that will go on and on forever. Uh, and uh, and yes, funding will be required, but we will have that funding. Thanks very much, Carl. Um, one last question before we go into the breakout rooms, um, and it's from Mark uh, from the National Trust. Mark. Hello, just a couple of practical questions left for, for Matt. The, he has been talking about the, the scree pitching and that technique has been used for using that small stones for building a pitch. Uh, pitching, but in this case for building drains, uh, have been anything assessed using that small stones, or is not needed the, to build drains on that scree area? Um, yeah, no, it's a good point. Um, I, I think you know using the the smaller stones like that, you're more looking at um, like a, a almost like a pitched Ford. You know, so it would be, you know, like um, in simplistic terms, like a ramp down and a ramp back up again, you know, like using the smaller stones to, uh, so to provide the ramp. So you would have the same idea. So rather than having like a, a horizontal treading platform that you would tread on using that technique, you would maybe ramp the stones down at an angle and like a slight angle so people it would still be grippy enough for people to walk on and then uh, back up again. Although I don't know how many drains that we're going to construct up at the cone because like because of the amount of scree it, it might be actually you know again this is something that we'll find out once we're there but it might be like free draining because of the holes and amongst all the, the stones. And also due to the fact that on both sides of the path that we're going to be constructing, we're also constructing like a revetment on both sides and they will act almost like uh, to deter the water from coming on the path. Eventually we have to find a break to get any water off. So I can see as like constructing maybe one drain or one or two drains um, in like say a hundred meter stretch. Um, but again, if we find any suitable stones, we'll, you know, we'll earmark them, uh, you know, for that. 
Great. Look, thanks, Matt. Um, I know we could carry on with questions all day, but we've a lot of people here and we want to give you all an opportunity to be able to say 